Welcome, everyone. It's Henry DeVries, the CEO of Indie Books International. So glad you're here. This is our <laughs> weekly podcast on marketing with a book and a speech. So we have many of our authors who have gathered for this, and we have a very special author as guest today. Uh, that explains why I'm dressed the way I'm dressed. More on that in a minute. Uh, but I really like to start with a author roll call. So this is gonna be the author roll call. You get to unmute yourself. And today we're gonna to do it a little different, just to mix you up, a little different. Say your name, say the title of your book, take a full stop, and then say the subtitle is, and give the subtitle. So, hi, I'm Henry DeVries. I'm the author of Marketing with a Book. It's the how to attract high paying clients by speaking. So that's not it, but that was close. <laughs> I wasn't prepared, but you get to be prepared. So I'm giving you a second here. So uh, we're going to go with uh, our chairman, uh, Mark, to start us off. And then it'll be Mark, David, and Bill. Thank you, Henry. Uh, my name is Mark LeBlanc, and I'm the author of Growing Your Business, What You Need to Know, and what you need to do. Thank you. David, and then Bill. David, you're on mute. Yes, I was. Hi, I'm David Goldman, and I am the author of The Road to Happiness. The subtitle is How to Get What You Really Want. Thank you. Bill and then John Lockhorst. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Leiter. My new book, Almost Ready to Be Released, is Mastering Your Balance, a guide to leading and living at your full potential. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. I'm John Lockhorst, and the title of my book is Mission Critical Leadership, How Smart Managers Lead Well in All Directions. Thanks. Jackie and then Patty. Hi, everyone. I'm Jackie Kustabor. My book is My Earthquake Preparedness Guide, Simple Steps to Getting You, Your Family, and Pets Prepared. Thanks. Patty and then Sonia. Hello, and I'm Patricia Watkins, and my book is Land and Expand, Six Simple Strategies to Grow Your Company's Top and Bottom Line. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sonia Jante, and uh, I'm the author of The Integrative Leader, How Leaders Who Use Both Sides of the Brain Build Resilient Companies. Sonia, may I, are you open to me giving you a tip? Sure. Okay. Take your book, put your finger on one corner, your finger on the other corner. Now, hold it head high and lean it slightly in. There you go. Uh, because we were getting the glare and missing your name. Okay. So this is how we see that and we, we get to take it in. Thank you. Great job. Thanks. Um, Craig and then Jeff. Yes. Thanks for practicing there. Thank you, Henry. And as you can see, my background isn't working. Uh, my name is Craig Lauder. I'm the author of Smooth Selling Forever, Charting Your Course for Predictable and Sustainable Sales Growth. Thanks. Uh, Jeff and then Teresa. Hi, my name is Jeff Foley and my book is Brave Business Leadership. Grow competent, confident leaders and get great results. Thank you. <laughs> Teresa. Hello, I'm Dr. Teresa Ashby and my book is Better Implementation Now. Eight ways even great strategies fail and how to fix them. Very good. So I'm Henry DeVries, co-author of Build Your Consulting Practice, How Independent Consultants Deliver Value to Clients and Grow Their Business, co-authored with Mark LeBlanc. So Mark, why, as chairman of Indie Books International, uh, why don't you give us your tip of the week, a little wisdom before we get started here? Well, thank you, Henry. And my tip of the week is uh, never underestimate the power 
uh, of an idea. Uh, in Minneapolis or in Minnesota, it has been frigid. I think the average uh, high has been about 11 below zero. It was 45 degrees below zero wind chill a number of days in the last two weeks. And it was approximately 28 years ago when we had two brutal winters back to back. And on a lark, my younger sister Kathy and her friend came up with a silly idea uh, to publish a book titled, It's So Cold in Minnesota. That went on to sell over 100,000 copies as a joke. I'm not even the best-selling author in my own family. <laughs> uh, um, and so I just share that with you because I think we all have so many good ideas that come into our mind and are lost. So make sure that you are capturing uh, those ideas and recording them and, and, and trust your hunch. Um, uh, you've let, probably let go of more good ideas than uh, you could ever know what to do with. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, Mark. I visited Mark one January up in Minneapolis and the headline said that um, the temperature in Minneapolis that day was warmer I'm sorry, Mars was warmer than Minneapolis that day. So that's how cold it was. So thanks for that. Okay, uh, so one author that didn't get on the roll call is because I'd like him to spend 15 minutes with us. It's uh, Dr. Irvin Nugent, Leadership Lessons from the Pub. Four years ago, Mark and I met him at a speakers conference in Las Vegas. And he was honing his skills as a speaker. He was doing well at that, but wanted to do better and wanted to have some conversations around a book. And he told a story so powerful. I said, that should be the start of your book. And uh, I hope he shares it. It is the start of his book. He grew up in Northern Ireland during what uh, is euphemistically called the troubles or understated <laughs> the troubles. Um, I worked in the, during that time, I worked uh, in Toronto, Canada, and uh, one of the, my colleagues was from Belfast, uh, Jimmy Brown. And uh, I said, well, Jimmy Brown, uh, you know, what, uh, what was your background? He goes, oh, uh, my father was a tail gunner on a bread truck. So it was a rough time then. And uh, Dr. Nugent, uh, uh, grew up in all of that. So I'm going to have him take it away. Uh, in addition to telling us about his book that for some reason is coming out on March 17th. I know that's Mark's birthday. I, I'm not sure if there was any other reason he chose that day to bring out his book, but uh, there you have it. And I, I want him to share how he gets booked as a speaker and give you ideas on how you can get booked as a speaker. Uh, because Publishing the book is the starting line. It's just the starting line. So, and there is no finish line. It's a marathon that we're running to get people to pay attention to our book. So uh, Irvin, if you would take it away, the stage is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. You know, the year was uh, 1973. And in 1973, just like today, there was a pandemic in the world except, and a crisis except, it wasn't about a virus. They actually were in the midst of an oil shortage. And all over the world, there were long lines uh, of cars wrapped around gas stations. In 1973, the Heinz Corporation ran into trouble because of a worldwide shortage of tomatoes. And you think there are issues with a shortage of toilet roll, just imagine having no tomato ketchup. In 1973, uh, for the first time in the United States, whiskey outsold bourbon. But in 1973, in Northern Ireland, the troubles that had began about three years before reached a new pinnacle. It pitted the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, against uh, the Protestant forces in the British Army. 
One was fighting for independence, the other were fighting for the status quo. And in the years that preceded that, there wasn't a man, woman, or child who was not impacted by that violence. And on March 30th of the same year, a beautiful day in Balamagori, a small sleepy village in the western part of the province. Brian and Teresa had gone shopping in Belfast, the capital. And about 5.30 in the evening, they were returning. Teresa was excited because she had bought a dress for an upcoming wedding of her sister-in-law, Maureen. And so as they got back home, she rushed upstairs to show her four daughters, Mary, Kate, Anne, and Susan, the new dress. Brian went into the pub to relieve the barman who had been working all day and was tired. About two hours later, two masked IRA gunmen walked into the pub. One of them gathered all the customers, put them against the wall and held them at gunpoint. The other proceeded to place a bomb on the counter, lit the fuse, looked at Brian and said, you have five minutes to clear the place before this goes off. Brian immediately sprung into action. As the customers fled out the front door, he ran up the back stairs. He warned his wife and four daughters, and then he went to the bedroom of his only son who was sleeping. He grabbed him from the bed, ran out the door, down the stairs, out the side door, across the road. He was relieved to see his wife and four daughters had made it safely to the other side. Just then, terrible sound erupted and fire spread instantaneously throughout the building. Brian and his family watched while everything they owned burnt before their very eyes. Still holding on to his six-year-old son, Brian raised a clenched fist in an act of defiance and said from deep within him, watch me build again. Brian was my father. And I still remember the clenched fist. In the days after the bombing, all of us reacted in our own different ways. My mother and sisters were silent and introverted, trying to process what had happened. I, however, found that I had encountered a new fame. You see, we had made the BBC News. And so all the village could talk about was that bombing. And of course, here was I, the great survivor. And so I lavished all the praise and the bravery that came upon me. My father, however, found a spark deep within him that enabled him to act on that promise to rebuild. And silently, and yet with great determination, he enacted the promise. He found a tent. He found some booze. Neighbors brought some furniture. And in April the 8th, barely a week after that bombing, on the one side, if you'd been there, you'd have seen the burning remains of the pub. And on the other, you'd have seen a tent and in the tent were the locals, full of music and laughter and the sound of story. On one side of the parking lot was the evil that humans can do to each other. And on the other was the hope that springs from the heart. That story on the surface is a story of destruction. And yet within it is a story of courage and resilience and the power of the human spirit. So that is the beginning of the book. And from there comes different stories of growing up. You know, um, whenever I started, I think initially when I'd first conversation with Henry, I wasn't going to write that book. It was a different book altogether. And 
uh, some words of wisdom that probably Henry said if he didn't, he should have said it, were, you know, don't write the book until you're ready. Don't force it. And I found myself in a situation where I was forcing a story and a, and, and a book that just wasn't ready yet. And I remember um, I said to Henry, we decided, you know, maybe this would be the story, something around the pub and the lessons. And I remember flying to Ireland and um, I had a plan. I'm a, I'm a planner. So I had everything planned out. I had all my itinerary. And I landed in Dublin airport. It was about uh, 5.30 in the morning. And something in my heart just said, that's just throw away that itinerary and do something else. Visit your childhood. And so I got a rental car. And this time I had to pay the extra because, you know, they asked you that question, are you going to take the rental car to Northern Ireland? Because that requires extra fees just in case the troubles are over, but, you know, we still have the fear that something might happen in the car. And I visited uh, all my childhood places and the new book was born. And I think for me, it was a lesson that, you know, whatever we're giving birth to, really, we have to have a passion about it and it has to link into something we really want to say. And, and where I'm going with this is, um, I think, you know, part of that has taught me as well, how do I get uh, speaking engagements? And when Henry and myself were talking about maybe what did I want to share tonight with you all, um, I wanted to share a little bit about um, how I have, what has found, what I found helpful when it comes to getting some speaking engagements. Now, I come that, I come to that topic uh, declaring myself as an absolute novice just a few years ago. You see, because I was very blessed, but one of those blessings was also a curse in that I had started out as a executive coach and uh, I had started a business and, and thankfully I had clients coming to me and I had referrals and I became lazy. I thought that Clients magically appeared because other people spoke about how wonderful I am and they would knock at the door and call me and business grew. And that worked for a while, but it's not going to work for the speaking business because that's a different world. And so I had to go back to the bare bones and re-educate myself and to build up a more sustainable business that would provide me with some speaking engagements. And I just want to share with you five wonderful bits of wisdom. I, they are not coming from me. They are coming from gurus who have taught me how to build this business. But I'm, I'm sharing them in the hope that perhaps some of them might spark a little bit of interest for you to explore that might help you as well in this uh, world of trying to get some speaking gigs. So first point I would say is this, is get laser clarity on the problem you solve. Um, I have had to re-educate myself. And part of my re-education has been this. When people said to me, Irvin, what do you do? I'm a speaker, I'm a trainer. And of course, what, I, what I've learned to say now is I'm not a speaker or a trainer. I actually happen to be a person who has expertise in a topic, my expertise is in leadership and in emotional intelligence. And I use speaking and training as a vehicle to share my expertise. And that changes for me mentally, it changed where I was having focus and changed how I went about the conversation. Because what it forced me to do was to be very clear about the value I deliver. I'm not delivering speaking and training I'm delivering value, I'm delivering my expertise, which will have an impact. And so some of the questions that I was invited to consider to really help me hone in on that laser clarity was, you know, first of all, my client. And some simple questions, what jobs do my clients have? What are the pains that my client is going through? What are my clients looking to gain? What costs them money or effort or time? What annoys or frustrates them? 
What risks do they face? What are their challenges? And to really be able to, to really paint that and to go good. And, and, and it is not a fun exercise. It's so frustrating because like, oh, but it's worth spending time and going digging deeper and deeper into that. And then asking the question, what are they looking to gain? What are my clients looking to gain? What do they dream about? What is this new position that they want to be in? And after you've kind of focused on the clients, then it becomes then, well, what do I offer? What's the value I'm bringing to that situation? How can I relieve some of those pains? What are some of the benefits that I can offer? How can I surprise them with some of the things that I can offer them? And then, and only then, do I think that I, I moved into them, well, what's my products? What am I selling? And so, what we, of course, what, what we're building up is this ICP, the ideal client profile. But I think really digging deeply into it and kind of really immersing ourselves in that um, it, it, it really, um, I found it helpful to bring up two or three past clients and just really build up a profile about them, about their psyche, about everything. And I think, you know, what we're hoping for, or what, what I tried to do then is at the end to come up with a, a, a demographic and a psychological profile. So part of what I've, I've attempted to do is, is here, here's the demographics about my client. This is their industry. This is some of the titles that they might have. Uh, this is uh, their ages. This is the size of the company. Um, and this is some of the main problems. And then go into some of the psycho psychometrics as well. Can okay, you have a psychometric um, description of them? Here's some of their wants, their needs, their pains, and how I bring that. I mean. Um, I did that a few years ago. I did it a year ago, and I'm just redoing it again, just to make sure. And every time I do it, every time I go through an exercise, I dig deeper and deeper and deeper, and it's really helpful. Because I think if you get that right, it really helps. It's the foundation of everything you're offering when you're looking for speaking. Um, there's a great resource um, on the internet called Strategizer, um, and I can send the link later. Um, but it's a free resource that takes you through a whole exercise of uh, establishing your value proposition. And um, I know for me that that clarity has really helped me as I have conversations about what I'm bringing into uh, another business. So that's tip number one. Tip number two would be uh, research your competition. Um, I remember I, I did some work uh, with uh, Three Ring, which is a, an organization that helps speakers. And one of the things that they're, they're, they really suggest is take five to 10 of your competitors. You should be able to name them. Who's in your field? Who's offering the same services that you are? And, and try to choose someone who maybe you might be a little bit head off, someone you might be on par with, and then someone who is you emulate to be someone who's ahead of you and take a deep dive into them. What do their websites look like? What do their videos look like? What kind of fees are they charging? And then a great exercise is where do they speak? Um, because if we know where they're speaking, then it's another opportunity for us, you know? Um, uh, and so what I'll do is I'll do a Google search. I've got some of my, my competitors. Uh, I'll um, uh, search where they've been speaking. And it gives me some great ideas about organizations that are receptive to the topic that I talk about. And of course, no matter who your competition is, you're going to talk about your topic in a different way than they do. You're going to have different stories, a different approach. I mean, how many speakers are there in emotional intelligence? Only one that I know of so far grew up in a pub in Northern Ireland and uses that. So it's a different approach and not to be afraid. I, I, I have to admit, I had to get over the whole psychological thing of, of being afraid and the competition and all that. And I think it's, it's really complimentary and it can really help. Um, tip number three is choose Elaine. <laughs> uh, I remember when I started 
uh, as an executive coach <clears throat> and it was a new business. I did everything you shouldn't do. I lived in Florida. I was CEO of a social service agency. Um, I had an opportunity to move to DC to go to school. I created a business. I quit my job without a plan. I moved to a city in which I knew about three people. It was the worst business plan ever. And, um, and I remember in the first year of that coaching business, someone said to me, well, who's your client? Who's your client? I said, the person that pays for it, you know, anyone, I'll take anyone. And I think that's fine to begin with. But very soon, I think we have to begin to define uh, who, who is our client? Who is our industry? What are we targeting? And I think the more specific we can get, the better it is because the targeting becomes better. You know, especially in a topic like leadership or emotional intelligence, um, you know, the, the temptation is to target everyone. And, and I think that problem is, of course, it lies flat. So um, when you think about an exercise that, that uh, Fort Sakes actually, I heard him talk about, is to create a, a mind map and put your industry so like for me, an industry that I target is the beverage industry, of course, just because of its tie-in with the topic. But then brainstorm around that. Uh, what are the journals of that industry? Uh, what are their meanings? What are their key meanings, both national, state, and local? What are their associations? What associations do they belong to? What conferences do they have? Um, what are the 100 top, 200, 300 top corporations or organizations in that industry? Um, where do they hang out on social media? All of those are great questions because you can begin to dive in a little bit deeper and get a feel for uh, some of the concerns, their energies, where they hang out. And it just enables you to, to target a lot more. Uh, tip number four, uh, persistence. Uh, you know, I've come to understand that my main objective is not to sell a keynote. It's not to sell a training. My key aim is to open the door for a conversation that I can talk to someone about their needs and to really discuss if I'm the right fit for those needs. Because, and that's helped me psychologically. I am not, I, I did not grow up in a sales background. Cold calling was like, bring me literally with a cold sweat. And, and it really helped me change the conversation. What I, I'm just trying to have a conversation about your needs Am I a right fit? Because if I'm a right fit, then I am going to speak from my heart about the value I can offer. And if I'm not the right fit, maybe I can name someone who is, and I'm not going to try and sell something where there's not a right fit. Um, and so to, to do that, the conversation, but also to be persistent. Um, there is so much noise. And um, I think, you know, my present process of, of uh, when I try and cultivate a relationship, I have uh, four emails. There's a series of two calls I try to initiate. I do a LinkedIn uh, outreach as well. So it's taught me that over a few months that I'm trying to seek access points to set up that conversation. And, and at the end of that, if it doesn't happen, that's fine. Maybe I'll assess it. Maybe I'll want to try sometime later. But that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the booking. I'm looking for the conversation. And then the final point I would just say is, um, how can you make yourself stand out from other speakers? Um, I suppose I shouldn't delight in the fact that there are still bad players in the speaking industry, but there are. And I think it creates opportunities for us. There are still prima donnas out there. I was on a call, uh, uh, I was listening to a call a few weeks ago uh, about associations and they were talking about their pet peeves with um, uh, speakers. And one of the pet peeves was that this person wanted a particular color of limo. And I'm like, really? Oh my God. And, and you know, you kind of laugh at it, but that creates an opportunity for us. 
Because if, if we are easy to work with, if we are passionate about providing value, uh, if we, um, instead of taking weeks to respond, I mean, one of the things I've, I've tried to do is if I get an email and I'm available, you're going to get a response within 10 seconds. People know that. Meeting planners want to know you're available. Meeting planners want to know that they get in touch with you. One of the things that uh, meeting planner told me the other day, their worst nightmare is that they sign a contract and the person disappears until the day. So just to have that level of responsiveness, uh, making it easy, making a delight to work with and um, being responsive, being helpful, uh, just general things and coming up uh, with speaking engagement, noticing that if the meeting's running 10 minutes late to say to the meeting planner, would you like me to go 10 minutes less to make you on time? I, I did that once about a year and a half ago and you would have thought that I had parted the Red Sea and that uh, wonderful things had happened because I was responsive, I was listening, and I created uh, this opportunity to make the meeting planner look good. So uh, I mean, one of the ways that, that I just say, have outstanding customer service, be amazing to work with, be humble, and you will get referred and people will remember that. And then one, I'm gonna sneak in a sneaky sixth that I didn't say, but one would be in these days, I think it's important for us to have a virtual reel. So we all have our speakers reels. I think it's important as well for us to have uh, a reel that shows not only that we are virtual ready, because I think people need to know that they have confidence in us and we have confidence in our ability, but also that I think that we can deliver the same impact, the same value virtually. Um, I think if there's one thing I've learned in the last year trying to adapt, it is that um, organizations are looking for great content more than ever. And I think what they want is confidence that our content can be delivered not only virtually, but can have an impact virtually as well. So we've got a video, even a small video that shows that we're capable but then also that we're delivering this value and impact virtually, I think that's a huge selling point and can give confidence to the buyer as well. So there you go. That's my five points with a little extra one uh, to make us virtually ready. Five and a half jazz hands. Okay, thanks. Irvin, thanks so much. I have so many questions and Mark, I wanna put you on standby. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, if you'll take it, I'll pass the interviewer stick because you're past president of the National Speakers Association. And I know you have a lot to talk about when it comes to running a speaking business. So, but, but I'll start first. Uh, and um, so I've heard people have tested positive now for Zoom butt. So I really liked your idea that uh, we have to understand that and know that we've got to present to people who are in that way. So great. Um, but let's go back to when we were creating uh, the book. Um, the subtitle, uh, we went around and around on this subtitle to really get clarity around the outcome. And, the, and then there's a how you deliver the outcome. So your outcome, a fully engaged workplace. Why don't you talk about that for a second? So as I was trying to struggle with the, the um, subtitle, I went back to the title and the title is Leadership Lessons from the Pub. And of course the question is, so what? What has the pub to teach us? And I think as the more I thought about that, the more I realized that here is an institution, a hallowed institution, many, many years old, many hundreds of years old, that has provided a space in which people voluntarily come, in which there is a place of connection, in which there is a place of relationship, in which people laugh and joke and have fun, and in which there is a vulnerability in a way that people open up. And then my light bulbs went off and said, oh, wow, you know, there are the same problems that we're struggling with in workplaces. You know, our workplace, how do we engage employees? 
How do we make the workplace somewhere where people want to go? How can we have psychological safety where people can be vulnerable and can share? And how can we have fun? And, uh, and so therefore that's where the subtitle came, you know, using the power of emotional intelligence to build a fully engaged workplace. And emotional intelligence is important because I remember having a conversation with a dear friend of mine and she shared, she said, you know, I, was, I, I ran a pub myself in London for two years. And she said, you know what? She said, that was the most difficult job I ever had. She goes, people don't realize the emotional intelligence it takes to be uh, running a pub and to be engaged with so many people and to be aware of what's happening and to be aware of what you bring. And so I think it, that's where the subtitle came from. This is this combination of emotional intelligence and then the engaged workplace. Tell them about when you're growing up that you, you know, you were the little boy who was telling people it's closing time and uh, drink up. Uh, uh, tell them about that. So um, for those of you who have English roots and versus Irish roots, uh, the English and the Irish um, are very different when it comes to pub closings. The English are a nation of, of law abiding citizens. And for Ireland, it's suggestions. So in England, uh, at the, when the time is up, uh, there'll be a little bell probably in the pub, you know, bing, 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 and everyone go, oh, radio, and they'll drink and off they go. <clears throat> in Ireland, that begins the negotiation. And this is kind of, you talk about learning negotiations. So then you, you start right now, ladies and gents, time please, have you no homes to go to? It begins the pleading, you know, case. And then, um, you know, you'll get the wit coming back. And I remember, uh, uh, and I must've been about 12 at the time, you know, screaming, trying to clear the pub. And, uh, and then John, who was in the pub saying, oh, Irvin, if you knew the home that I was going back to, you would be giving me another drink and not throwing me out. So kind of, you know, the whole guilt trip, et cetera. So all of it is, you know, so part of that is this, this great humor and negotiation. A lot of music, a lot of great music, Eat funny or sad, but it's all about drinking. That's what I've noticed. So now let's talk about music though, because there's just a, a little masterclass here because you wanted to use song lyrics in your book and your developmental editor said, red flag, red flag. So tell them how you navigated that. So uh, first of all, music's important. There's, um, the Irish are of course music makers and um, there's a part in the book where I talk about how music more than any other element helps get to the emotional heart and can help us express our emotions in a way that just spoken words cannot. So it was very important to me. And, and so many of my memories of growing up in the pub, um, my mother listening to music, crying because it touched her heart, et cetera. So I said to Henry, you know, well, we have to have music. And therein began another journey. So, oh, wow. For the, the biggest uh, issue is of course, finding who the actual publisher is and that is trickier than you think. You think you just look up a book and the song's owned by someone. Well, um, there are three songs that I used and uh, one song is owned 50% and then 25% and 25%. And you have to get the rights of all three of them. And if one doesn't give you the rights, you cannot use it. And so there's a, a great organization in New York uh, uh, called Hal Leonard. And it's always the place to begin because they would have the biggest library. Uh, but then you just have to be a detective. And um, sometimes, you know, they're just not helpful and they, they can point you in the direction. And, uh, but you have to kind of dig a little deeper. And then sometimes you just have to be patient and uh, wait for a response. Uh, it is not inexpensive, uh, depending on the song that you are looking for rights to can cost anywhere from uh, $50 to two to three or $400, depending on, on, on the popularity of the song and where you are. But it's, uh, it's essential because um, as an industry and rightly so, uh, if you are uh, using the lyrics um, uh, without permission, they have full right to come after you. Unchain the attorneys and they do unchain them. They, they will, they will. 
Yeah, lyrics are different than other types of writing, song lyrics. So they're, you can't use one line of a song and think it's fair use. Now, if you're quoting Peter Drucker or you're taking a kind of a, a couple of lines from uh, um, oh, Stephen Covey or something like that, uh, there's a fair use doctrine. Uh, now there's no, there's no exact word count, but it's just that for scholarship reasons, uh, you can use this. It's, that mm -hmm. is not for song lyrics and it surprises some people. The other thing, Irvine, I just, uh, Irvine, excuse me. I live near Irvine. Uh, Irvine, um, what I wanted to say is sometimes like with Stephen Covey, one of our authors wanted to use a concept and I said, oh, you're gonna need to get permission. Oh, I don't think he'd mind. Oh yeah, you're gonna need permission. This is not an area where there's forgiveness. Where people say, oh, it's better to uh, seek forgiveness than approval. Not in this. Um, one of our authors, and I'll leave names out of this, one of our authors quoted Michael Jordan in his book. Fair use, First Amendment rights. You can talk about somebody. It's how I was allowed to write a book about Warren Buffett. I didn't have his permission. It was I had the lawyers at McGraw Hill that I was working with, and I didn't want to antagonize the second richest man. So I had the right to do that, though. But if you use too much of someone else's work, they can come after you. So after really working with this author, she went to Stephen Covey and uh, the Covey organization had a form and it was $50. And with a signed form and a $50 payment, she was home free and, and did not have to worry about them coming after. But this other author that we had who used Michael Jordan, well, then he published a blog and in the blog quoted Michael Jordan and then did a promotional video and thought, well, we'll quote the book where we quote Michael Jordan and showed an image. You just crossed a big line there. Uh, blogs and articles are not protected speech under the First Amendment. There's something called the right of publicity that celebrities have. And as I understand, the settlement was in six figures for his appropriation of Michael Jordan's celebrity to promote himself. So it's an area that we have to be tricky. And I always say, you know, I'm not an attorney. This is not legal advice. Please seek competent legal advice. Um, one, one person though, I did go stronger than that. And uh, I said, this chapter has to change. You've changed the names of people, but it's pretty obvious. It'll be to people in this town who you're talking about. And you'll, you, you could be sued for libel. Well, I think it's my right to do this. I said, well, as your publisher, I think it's my right to demand that you talk to an attorney. Well, the attorney happened to be her um, sister. <laughs> and her sister came back and said, listen to your publisher, get rid of that chapter, you're gonna be sued. So it's just these legal things we have to be careful of. Um, and it also includes Henry, one of the, my book is quite a few pictures. So again, ah. uh, again, had to go through the, the making sure that I had the rights, including like, um, so, so I, I wanted some pictures of some pub interior pub pictures. So I, I, there's a few in my memory that I have. So I went to Facebook and there was a LinkedIn, I, 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 there's a concept, there's a little place in a pub in Ireland called a snug. And a snug is a, a little enclosed part where in the days when women and men were not, women were not allowed into the pubs, they went to the snug to have their drink. But there's some great ones now. Um, but I found a great picture in um, uh, the Instagram, but I had to hunt down the Instagram person. I had to contact them and say, hey, I want to use this picture in the book. Do I have permission? So as well, just making sure, even if it's not as formal as a publishing company for a song, if you're going to use a picture from another person, even as from Facebook or whatever, just to make sure that you've got documentation of them giving you permission. So we want you to have photo credits with that. You do photo permission. Um, you make sure you have something in writing in your file that you have permission for it. Um, 
I got caught with a royalty-free image. I was on a website, these are royalty-free images. Um, I published a blog with a photograph and Getty Images came after me for $1,200. And they said, we didn't give permission to them to put that on the website. So it was no defense that uh, it was on that royalty-free site. And you know, so you do have to be especially careful with photographs and all that. Mm. Um, I ran afoul of the Elvis Presley estate <laughs> and my letter to them began, I'm puzzled by your objection to this. We thought it was honoring the memory of Elvis Presley. We'll immediately take that down. Um, we had one author who um, disregarded that the title of his book, somebody had a trademark on and he said, well, nobody will be bothered by this. Well, we got the cease and desist letter. He had published a thousand copies of his book. He wanted the savings on the printing. And uh, that was what we call Fahrenheit 451, uh, which is the Ray Bradbury novel about the temperature books burn at. So he had to burn those books. Uh, and that, that was a big, uh, a big hit. So areas we need to be careful in. Uh, Mark, do you want to ask any questions from a speaker's standpoint and bring up some issues that you caught? Um, certainly, Henry. Thank you. And uh, Irvin, really nice to be in your virtual audience here today. Um, you have what I call a magnetic style. And um, I think my first question for you is, um, what specifically is a right fit audience for you? because you never know who might be on this call, who might know someone, we'd love to give you a referral. There are two audiences that I really resonate well with uh, as regards experience level. I do a lot of work with um, C-suite VP level executives um, and really helping them become more self-aware, harness the power of their emotions. And then I also love working uh, with high potentials. And so I've done quite a bit of work in organizations that tend to have uh, organized programs uh, mm -hmm. in which they have a, a development track for high potentials. And I've gone in quite a few times, love to go in and uh, present to them on emotional intelligence and, and leadership development. So those, those are two segments that I really, really enjoy working with. Terrific. Um, someone posted in the chat box uh, strategizer.com. Does that yes. ring a bell? Is that the yep. link that you were so that's referring the link. to? Yep. yep. That's the link. It's a, it's a downloadable book and uh, powerful, powerful questions to really help you focus on the value that you offer. And I, a little birdie told me that you might have something for us. Oh, yes. So one of the, one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, when we were developing the book, um, I, I really believe that what I want to offer people is something practical. Emotional intelligence is only as good as it is practiced. And so I didn't want a theoretical book. I wanted a practical book. And uh, one of the things that I developed was an on-demand learning course to go in my book. And then that also got me into some um, an introductory course in emotional intelligence. So it's just released, and I would love to share it with you all. Um, and it's uh, it's called the uh, uh, EQ Roadmap, and it introduces you to the principles of emotional intelligence and gives you some practical uh, exercises. So thank you. Uh, thank you so very much. <clears throat> and uh, uh, specifically, is there a marketing idea? that you tried that ended up working better than you thought it would? Interesting question. Um, I would have to say that um, the, po the power of video. Mm -hmm. um, I resisted video for a long time. And um, I, 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 of course, I, I come from this I came from this mentality that it had to be perfect. And believe me, no video is ever perfect. But um, I, I took the, you know, the jump and got into doing just some very simple videos and uh, initial sizzle. And for me, that transformed my business. When, when, 
oh, way more than I even thought it would. So, you know, I, I kind of, I struggled with this fact that I had to have all these um, previous recordings. And of course, you know, it's the chicken and egg story. It is, you know, kind of like, well, um, um, not every conference is going to give you 4K coverage that you can use for this amazing sizzle reel. So how do you get? And so uh, one of the, the ideas that, you know, kind of that really transformed my business is that I met um, really wonderful um, um, person that works in uh, speakers bureaus in, um, in Las Vegas, Jennifer Lear. And Jennifer was um, helping you speakers with a video and that would look kind of professional, but you didn't have to have all this B-roll and other mm. speaking engagements. And that marketing idea transformed the business. So the oh, power wow. of video, power of video. Okay. Thank you. I've got one last question, then I'm going to turn it back to Henry. Uh, I think there might be a question or two in the chat box. Um, <clears throat> if your in-person fee was 10 bananas, mm -hmm. uh, where is your virtual fee landing? Uh, when I start the conversation, I will always start the conversation with 10 bananas and then I'll see where the conversation goes uh, because I, I always try and emphasize that um, even though I'm virtual, I'm still providing the same value. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I will give you credit for the fact that I can roll out of bed, take a shower, and come down in half an hour and get myself set up. Um, but uh, what I'm finding is that uh, I'm settling around five bananas, five to six bananas. Got it. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, really One enjoying getting to know authors, you, Irvin. By the way, oh, sorry, Mark. One of our other authors, by the way, who charges 10 bananas is taking five bananas for the virtual keynote mm -hmm. because she doesn't have to travel. Mm -hmm. And do those other things. Yep. Um, so that's a that's a good discussion. I think that's another discussion we can have. Although one kind of just intersect one one thing I am finding is that the keynotes tend to be five bananas, but I think there are greater if you've really dynamite training and you're offering trainer over a longer period, I think there is more to be said for charging your regular 10 banana rate for 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 training. And I think what what, I, what I'm finding is I can get better rates with training than I necessarily can say with a one-off keynote. Makes sense. There was a question in the chat box about um, your inside out figurines, if you could uh, address <laughs> those. Yeah. So I, uh, uh, Inside Out is a movie. If you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. I don't care who I coach. I don't care how old they are. I don't care what level they are. I make them watch it even with their kids. And it's a movie about emotions. Um, the scientific advisor was a gentleman called Paul Ekman, whose work uh, I immerse myself in. I'm actually one of the few worldwide trainers that teach his material. Um, he is the gentleman who, when psychology ignored emotions, uh, dug deep into them and, uh, and discovered microexpressions, suppressed emotions, etc. So this movie, these characters are the different emotions that appear in the movie. And uh, these are collector's items. You cannot get them anymore. Um, and I grabbed them a few years ago. And I love it because uh, people point it out and in conversations. And it's a great marketing thing because uh, people will say, what are those? And I'll say, oh, I'm glad you asked. These are emotions. And let me tell you a little bit about the background. And it leads so naturally into, you know, this is at the core of leadership, uh, our emotional uh, self-awareness and our management. Irvine, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, uh, we could, I think somebody asked, is that your real accent? Yes, that is his real accent. <laughs> so uh, thank you for sharing this. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on future calls and best wishes with that March 17th book launch. Um, how could you support him? Well, there'll be a 99 cent Kindle version of that book. And if you go on and buy it and then go to Amazon and post a review, you're a verified purchaser. And that goes a long way. And people judge us by many things, but one of the things they judge us by is how many reviews do you have on Amazon? And that's one way we can help each other. I, I just was reading an article about big trends in publishing. And one of the biggest trends was 
authors collaborating to cross market each other. So we're we're part of a trend. Uh, so we're, we're, we're trend setting here. So let's keep it up. Thanks everybody. Uh, we'll see you next week on our Marketing with a Book and Speech podcast. Bye-bye.